it's really, really great to be here. What a great conference. Um, to be honest, I would actually like to start with just a couple of questions for you as an audience so that I can get to know you a little bit better and uh, adjust my talk, you know, if that's necessary. Um, so the, the first question I have for you, and, and just, just raise your hand if the answer is yes. The first question is, I have is, uh, who follows the news? Does anyone follow the news? Okay. Pretty much everyone, right? Who has a newspaper subscription? Okay. Um, yes. Um, um, who watches, still watches television? You do that as well? Yeah, okay. Last question. Who feels he or she has been completely brainwashed? and has developed an utterly twisted image of human nature in the past 200,000 years. Okay, we've got one person who's actually <laughs> know, knows what's going, what's going on. You know, I, I'm asking this question because the news is a pretty bad source of information, right? It's always about exceptions, about corruption, about crises, about terrorism, about, about violence, etc., etc. So if you hear about all these exceptions all day, at the end of the day, you'll know exactly how the world doesn't work. Right? You've got a completely upside down idea of what, what's actually going on. Now, you should know I studied uh, history for six years uh, at a university in Holland, Utrecht to be precise. And as a historian, you always have this, you know, this, this sort of guilty feeling, right? You, you had the fortune to be able to study for years at a university and taxpayers were, were making that possible. And then at the end of those six years, I had the feeling like, what can I actually give back to society? You know, studied all these obscure things that happened hundreds of years ago. So what, what is it? What can we actually learn from history? And one day I realized that I do have something that I can give back. I, I've, I've, I'm, I, I'm calling it now the, the biggest lesson of all world history. Uh, it's something that I recommend that you should shout out loud every morning, uh, that we should, you know, put central in all our educational systems. And uh, it's, it's very easy to remember, actually. The biggest lesson, ladies and gentlemen, of the past 200,000 years is that in the past, everything used to be worse. You know? <laughs> That's basically it. Um, six years of study, and then, then you have it. Uh, you know, for, for, <laughs> for, for about 99% of human history, about 99% of humanity was sick, poor, hungry, stupid, dirty, and ugly. You know, that's the natural state of humanity. And it started to change only a very short while ago. Obviously, with the Industrial Revolution, but especially in the past 100 or even 50 years, life standards have become much, much higher around the globe. Now, this is... Obviously, something you don't get from the news. There's never a headline that says, today, child mortality declined by 0.000001%. Because it happens every day. Uh, if we just look at some, some simple graphs, uh, what has happened in the past uh, 200 years? Well, this is uh, a simple example of how much richer we have become, how much wealthier we are right now. According to economists and historians' best estimates, about 200 years ago, 84% of the world population was living in extreme poverty. Nowadays, that's under 10%. If we look at health, for example, vaccination rates, just 30, 40 years ago, only 20% of the world population was vaccinated against terrible diseases like measles. Nowadays, that's more than 80%. If we look at violence, well, Again, you watch the news and you think, oh my God, it's, it's, it's more terrible than ever. But actually, since 1946, according to the Oslo Peace Research Institute, um, the amount of war deaths has gone down by more than 90%. We are living in the most safest of, of all periods in, in, in world history. Um, what do we still have to be afraid of? Uh, well, is, is anyone married here? Raise your hand if you're married. Okay, so that, that is really dangerous, because nowadays about a third of all murders are committed within marriages, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't say I didn't warn you. I, I, I really recommend divorce. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, it's, 
according to the statistics, it's much safer. But <laughs> what is the real problem of our time? I believe especially in a rich country like Norway, where so many things are so well cared for and are so efficient. What is the biggest problem of our times in our generation? Well, it's not that we don't have it good. The big problem is that we don't know where to go next. We don't have a big utopian vision for the future. We don't have like these, another big milestone that we want to achieve. Now remember, every milestone of civilization, the end of slavery, uh, democracy, equal rights for men and women, the welfare state, these were all utopian fantasies once, right? It always starts in, in, in the head of someone who is first dismissed as crazy or ridiculous or un unrealistic, impossible. And then these ideas start moving from the fringes towards the center. And suddenly they, be, they, they can become reality, utopia can become reality. And, and, and then we just think, oh, well, that's just normal. That's, we take it for granted. We see it as common sense. But the question I became fascinated in is, what's the next big thing? And I'm, I'm not talking about you know, the next iPhone or whatever. That's nice, but is it really radical progress? I'm talking about some next big th step like democracy, or like the welfare state, or like equal rights for men and women. Now, you might know this quote from Mahatma Gandhi. He never really said it, but it's still a great quote. Um, <laughs> and the quote goes like this. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Right? You might have heard of it. It's a beautiful quote. It's sort of what idealists, often leftist idealists, always say when they're young and they say, well, now they're not taking me serious now, but in the future they'll see I was right. But in 2015, something curious happened. This quote popped up on the Instagram page of this guy, Donald Trump. So what happened here? I think it perfectly des describes the experience the US had. First, they ignored him, then they lost at him, then they fought him, and then Donald Trump won. He became the president of the United States. Completely bizarre utopian idea just five, ten years ago, and then it happened. The same happened with Brexit. You know, if you go just back 20 years, the whole idea of Brexit was an idea on the lunatic fringe of British politics. No one took that seriously. And here we are. So in the long run, real politics with a capital P is not being done in places like Washington or Westminster where the parliaments are and the, the mainstream politicians and media are. Real politics that have, has a truly significant in, impact on the long term is being done by the crazy ones, the people who are dismissed as unreasonable and unrealistic. Now, nowadays, most of that utopian energy, I'd say, is not anymore with where it used to be in the 60s on, with the progressives and the left, and you know, you might remember the slogan from 1968, Paris, you know, be realistic, demand the impossible. No, it's now mostly on the right. So what, what did we see as well in 2016? We, we obviously saw the demise of Hillary, Hillary Clinton. Her slogan was, I'm the last thing standing between you and the apocalypse. You know, Lots of you have, have businesses. I don't think that's a great slogan, is it? It's not very inspirational. <laughs> like, <laughs> vote for me, I'm not the apocalypse. Um, it doesn't, doesn't seem like a very good idea for me. And then if you look at the, the more like, progressive left or radical left or um, you know, postmodernists in universities where, where I'm coming from, um, what I see is mostly people who know what they're against, right? So this is the problem with the left around the globe. They really know what they're against, against austerity, against the establishment, against homophobia, against racism, against, well, against everything. It's a book that recently came out by a very prominent uh, leftist intellectual from New York. Now, the thing is, I'm against most of those, those things as well, but you also need to know what you are actually for. So Martin Luther King, he never said, I have a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. He had a dream, something to strive for. And, and that's, that is exactly what we need right now. What we need are actually two things. We need that new vision of utopia for the 21st century, 
But we also need a completely different vision of human nature. Nowadays, so many people believe that deep down, we humans are all selfish or corrupt, or that civilization is just a thin layer, and that as soon as something happens, a war or a disaster or something terrible, then um, you know, everything goes wrong. I sometimes ask these qu this question to audiences. So uh, what would happen? I, I can ask it to you. What would happen if, if, if you're in a plane crash, the plane breaks up in three parts, what is going to happen? On planet A, everyone is like very cooperative, and the old and the children are being helped out of the plane first, and everyone's relatively calm, and most people survive. On planet B, everyone becomes really selfish, and you know, they trample over the kids and then the old people, and there's massive panic, etc., etc. What do you think, planet A or planet B? Well, I've primed you probably right now. Anyway, my experience is that about 95% of all people say, well, we live on planet A. Uh, sorry, planet B, where most people are selfish. Um, if we look at the research, if we look at the hundreds and hundreds of case studies we have, you know, since the, the Blitz, basically, you know, when the Germans bombed London during the Second World War, we've got mountains of evidence that especially during times of crisis, most people are really nice, you know? <laughs> they help each other. That is what is very fundamental to human nature. We are a very social, very cooperative species. But so often, we base our, intuition, uh, our institutions and our politics on the idea that most people are selfish. And these become self-fulfilling prophecies, because what you assume in other people is what you get out of them. Um, I think we can, we can move beyond that. And all of the ideas in my book, three ideas in total, they, they work with this different vision of human nature. Now, I'm afraid I don't have to, time to talk about all these ideas, so I, focus on the, I will focus on the first two, which is the idea of a universal basic income and the idea of a radically shorter paid work week. Now, let me first ask you a question. Raise your hand if you have never before heard of the idea of universal basic income, if that's a completely new idea to you. Is there anyone in the audience that has never heard about it? No one? Now, this is, this is really fascinating, actually, because just five years ago, when I first wrote about it, it was a completely forgotten idea. It was one of those ideas that was on the, you know, the lunatic fringe, that was not being taken seriously at all. And in a very short time, that idea managed to move towards the center. And I was even invited to go to Davos, you know, where the, the global elite meets, and where they are suddenly interested in basic income as well. That's really interesting. That it, that it can happen so quickly, but also that it doesn't start in places like Davos, but it starts something somewhere else. Um, basic income is obviously a very simple idea. It's the idea of completely eradicating poverty by giving everyone a monthly grant that is enough to pay for your basic needs. So food, shelter, uh, clothing, that's it. It's really a platform to stand on. In the end, it's mostly about freedom. So it's the freedom to say no to a job that you no longer want to do, and it's the freedom to say yes to things that you do want to do, move to a different city, move to a different job, start a new company. In that sense, you could call it venture capital for the people. Now, in the past couple of months, or in the last year, I've traveled to lots of different countries to talk about this idea, and the experience is different everywhere you go. So when I'm in Colombia, I obviously talk mostly about you know, how basic income is the most efficient, the most effective way to eradicate poverty, and that it's actually investment that pays for itself. When I was in Japan, most people wanted to talk about the benefits of a shorter working week and how basic income can help in this respect, because you know, they're not working a 15-hour work week, they're working a 15-hour work day, basically. And what my experience so far in Scandinavia has been I've been to Sweden a couple of times now, and I was in Norway here in August. My experience is that most people want to talk about only one thing. Meaning. Or the opposite, which is the big problem. Bullshit jobs. Have you ever heard of that concept? Okay, let me tell you that story then. It all starts with this guy. Anyone know who this is? John Maynard Keynes like one of the great British economists from the 20th century. 
And you, you probably know him because of his famous theory that the government should invest uh, in the economy, especially during times of recession. Um, but he, he has written a fascinating essay in 1930 that I really recommend uh, that you should read. It's called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. It's almost 100 years old now. You can just, if you Google it, you'll probably find it. Um, it's, it's eight pages long, and it's one of the most fascinating things I've ever read. What does Keynes do in that essay? He makes two predictions. The first prediction is that we'll be, we'll be a lot richer in the future. Now, that was actually a quite radical prediction in 1930. Remember, this was uh, the Great Depression. He was giving this lecture in Madrid during the, you know, the Spanish Civil War was about to break out. And he said, well, if we don't make too many big mistakes, like no more world wars and no more you know, austerity during recessions, then we'll be about four to eight times as rich. Well, you know, we did have this thing called the Second World War, and you know, we did have a lot of austerity during crises, but anyway, we still managed to end up like more than five or six times as rich as we were in 1930. So in that respect, the first prediction of, of Keynes you know, turned out to be true. But then he came with his second prediction, which was very simple. He said, we'll probably use all that wealth and all that money to have a bit more leisure every single year. So the work week will start shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And back then, in, uh, in the, when he wrote this essay, the work week was about 50 or 60 hours long on average. And he said, well, if, if trends just continue, then we'll have this 15-hour work week in 2030. I know this sounds pretty crazy, but actually, up until the 1970s, almost all the economists, almost all the sociologists, philosophers, they all believed that we would be working less and less and less, and that the great challenge of the future was going to be boredom. What are we going to do? when the robots have taken all our jobs? That was the big question that people, people asked themselves. And um, the question for us now is, what has gone wrong? I mean, there's, there's this beautiful essay, for example, that was written by Isaac Asimov, the great science fiction writer in the 1960s, and he said, well, boredom is going to be the great challenge of the future, and therefore, the biggest profession uh, will be the psychiatrist who have to treat all these people who are suffering from the symptoms of boredom. Now, today, it is true that one of the biggest professions you know, is psychiatry, but these people are not exactly treating people with boredom, right? They're, they're treating people who are suffering from burnouts and work-related depressions because they've been working harder than ever. So something has gone, gone really wrong. The question is, what happened? I think there are basically there are two answers, two explanations. The first explanation is one that you are probably familiar with. It's called consumerism. So the definition of consumerism is quite simple. Uh, consumerism is that you keep on buying stuff you don't need to impress people you don't like, right? <laughs> it might be familiar. Uh, for a long time, I thought that this must be the explanation. I mean, if you just look around, there's so much stuff that we don't need. I mean, it must be the explanation that we are working harder than ever to buy all that crap. But then I stumbled upon this essay, another essay that I recommend that you should read. It's, it's written by an, Amer an American anthropologist called David Graeber, and he coined this really interesting scientific term of the bullshit job. Now, it's very important that I explain clearly what a bullshit job is. A bullshit job is a job of which the person who has that job says, you know, him or herself, it's not me saying it as a historian, <laughs> uh, the person, him or herself, says, well, you know, if I don't go to work, show up, doesn't really matter. You know, so that's, that's the definition. At first I thought, well, how, how big can that be? You know, why would you ever want to have a bullshit job? Why, I mean, there's supposed to be some invisible hand in capitalism, right? That gets rid of all nonsense. So th this will probably be a very marginal phenomenon. So then I first wrote about it, and just confessions started pouring in. You know, lots of people saying, yes, 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 yes. I've got just one of those jobs. You're talking about me. And most of these people, well, they were not garbage collectors, and they were not teachers or care, care workers or nurses. They were mostly, you know, people with beautiful LinkedIn profiles, consultants, corporate lawyers, uh, lots of bankers, actually. Um, and they were all saying, well, actually, yeah, I mean, my salary is great, my colleagues are lovely, but the work I'm doing, I don't think it contributes anything 
towards society. So at that point, I wondered how big is it really? And I started looking at polls. And I found the first poll that was done in Belgium, uh, where researchers asked you know, a very simple question to people like, does your job add any, anything of meaning to society? And in Belgium, 30% of all workers said no. Like about a third of all workers said, no, no, I don't, I don't add anything of value. And at that point, I thought, well, come on, Belgium. That, that, that explains it. You know, we've got this long rivalry between Holland and Belgium. So I thought, oh, that's just the, these Flemish people once again. <laughs> yeah, just start working already. And, and, but then the problem is, is that there were a few couple of months later, there, a poll came out that was done in Holland, where it was 40%. So I was like, oh my god, this is, this is an, a different phenomenon. There was another poll that was done in the UK. 37% of all British workers said that they considered their job to be meaningless. And then I, you know, I went to, uh, to Oslo and to Stockholm, and I spoke to uh, a couple of audience, uh, sometimes very young audiences, and they only wanted to talk about bullshit jobs. They said, yeah, this is like the experience that we're having. Because obviously, the richer you get as a country, the more nonsense you can afford. You know, the more jobs you can afford. All these people sitting in the office all day, sending emails to people they don't like, writing reports no one's ever going to read, browsing Facebook. I mean, this can go on for a very long time. Nowadays, it's maybe 30, 40 percent. But w when the robots come and they'll take all our jobs, it could be like 50 or 60% in the future, or 100%. We could be living in some kind of society where we all just pretend to work and all pretend to be useful, while in reality we're just on Instagram. So, this is a pretty big question, I think, that it sort of shows us that we have to completely rethink nowadays what work even is. Who are the real wealth creators? Uh, let's take a look at for example, all the unpaid work that we're doing, you know, caring for our kids, caring for our elderly, volunteers work on a local level, doesn't show up in GDP. According to economists, it's not productive at all, but if these people stop doing that work, it's probably going to be quite disastrous. Um, I, I tried to look at a couple of other examples, because obviously the easiest way to, to find out whether your job is useful, yes or no, is just to stop doing it. So let's look at garbage collectors. Uh, there was a strike of garbage collectors in 1968 in New York. The strike lasted for six days, and it was a complete disaster. You know, after six days, uh, the, the city had to say, all right, all right, we'll pay you higher wages. We really can't do it without you, because the emergency state had to be declared, etc. So this is obviously not a bullshit job. At that point, I wondered, has it ever happened throughout world history, since the invention of money, that the bankers went on strike? It took me quite a few months of research, actually. <laughs> I started looking like, uh, I don't know, 5,000 years ago with the invention of money in Mesopotamia, and looked up all the way, and then I stumbled upon one example, one example of bankers going on strike. This was, well, where else? In Ireland, 1970. And the Irish bankers were angry that their wages were not keeping up with inflation. So they said, you know what, you'll have it. We're going to stop working, and then you'll see just how important we are. Now, all the experts at that point, all the economists, they all predicted that this would be a disaster. It would be like a heart attack for the economy. How was, how was Ireland ever going to survive with their, without their bankers? So the strike started from one day till the other. 85% of the Irish money supply was suddenly not accessible anymore. And what happened? Well, not much, actually. Um, the strike lasted, in the end, for six months. Uh, so garbage collectors got on strike for six days. This strike lasted for six months. And after six months, the bankers came back and said, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to work. So what happened in the meantime is that, well, obviously, the Irish couldn't do without money. They started writing IOUs to each other on the backs of cigar boxes or on toilet paper. And they invented their, their own new money system. Uh, who came, became the new bankers? Well, obviously, the pub owners. So Ireland had about 15,000 pubs at that point. And, and there's one historian who later wrote, I, I always love this line, that you know, if you sell liquids to people, you probably know something about the liquidity of your clients, right? So these, these, these pub owners were the perfect new bankers. 
And they said, yeah, sure, you can trust that, that IOU or that IOU that's being, uh, being, being given to you by that person. And it worked perfectly well. Actually, the Irish economy just kept growing. Companies kept adding jobs and nothing much changed and the bankers came back. So what's the, the, what is the lesson that we can take from this story? Well, obviously not that we don't need money. I mean, money is a great invention. Obviously, we need bankers. Obviously, we need a financial sector. The Irish immediately invented a new one. But we can do without a lot of the speculation and nonsense and, frankly, just bullshit that's going on in that industry nowadays. I think it's one of the most terrible tragedies of our time is that there are so many incredibly smart, brilliant young people who go on to great universities, maybe even to the US, you know, to the Ivy League universities, to Harvard, to Stanford, or to Cambridge or Oxford, and they get these beautiful LinkedIn profiles. And at the point in their life where they can really start contributing, you know, giving back to society, they go on and work for a company like Facebook or Google or Amazon, which is basically just to get people to click as much ads as possible. Or they go on to Wall Street, where they invent terrible financial products that don't create wealth, but actually destroy it. So they become sort of very sophisticated pirates. That is, if you, I mean, if you don't believe me, you can even look at recent reports from the International Monetary Fund or the Bank of International Settlements that says, you know, if too many people go into these kind of professions, they start destroying wealth, not creating it anymore. And if you don't believe me, ask it themselves or look in my email box. I've got so many people confessing like, you know, I earn a lot of money, but what am I actually contributing? So that is the deepest reason, I think, that countries like Holland, where I'm from, but also Norway should be having this discussion about basic income. You know, on the sur surface, basic income is a very simple idea, just a more efficient way of eradicating poverty, you know, getting ri rid of a lot of government bureaucracy, and that's great. I mean, I give all those arguments in my book, Utopia for Realists. But a, a deeper and more important reason is that basic income forces us to rethink what life is actually about. Um, let me give you one, one example of an experiment that happened, uh, because I think it's very important to look at the actual evidence. I mean, we can look, talk for a very long time, what will happen if you introduce a basic income? And lots of people may be skeptical, like, oh, well, we'll probably waste that money and be lazy. Again, this is the, the impression you would get from the news, is that most people are selfish and lazy. Um, in my book, I give the example of one of the most interesting experiments that happened. This was in Canada, 1974, in a small town called Dauphin. And the government wanted to test this idea because back then, at the end of the 60s or beginning of the 70s, almost everyone believed that basic income was going to be a reality. Actually, Richard Nixon, of all people, almost got basic income through Congress. So it's a pretty bizarre history that I'll save for another time. Um, so they started this experiment to test the effects. And for four years, there were lots of researchers, anthropologists, you know, economists, sociologists, who all moved into the town to study the effects. After four years, a new government was voted into power, and they said, this is a really crazy experiment. I mean, what are you actually doing here? You're giving people free money? Um, so what happened at that point is that, well, the experiment was canceled, and there was no money left to analyze the results. And then for 25 years, everyone forgot about it, basically. So there were 2,000 boxes full of data, you know, inter interviews, graphs, tables, numbers, etc. And they all put it away in an archive somewhere, and everyone forgot about it. It was only around 2005 that a Canadian professor, her name is Evelyn Forget, heard about the records, did the analysis, and discovered that actually the experiment was a huge success in many ways. So, uh, obviously, well, poverty went down, kids performed much better in school, uh, crime went down, social capital increased, people found more meaning in their jobs, um, the health of people in general improved. And one of the most important things researchers found in this experiment and in other experiments as well is that eradicating poverty in this way, investing in each other in this way, is actually an investment that pays for itself in the long run. It helps society, societies to create more meaning and more real wealth, not just financial wealth, but real wealth that really, really contributes something. So I think this is important to emphasize. If you want to get from utopia to reality, 
you obviously you need that big vision, you know, that pie in the sky, something that can inspire people, something that you want to get out of bed for in the morning. But you also need to have some kind of plan of how you're going there. And this is why I'm so enthusiastic about all these experiments that are happening around the globe. One of the most wonderful stories that I heard after publishing my book was from a, a woman in Canada. And she had read my book, and specifically, she had remembered one story that I tell about a small experiment that happened in London, where they gave 13 homeless men 3,000 pounds in unconditional cash. And seven, or a year after the experiment, seven out of 30 of the men, 13 of the men, had a roof above their head, two more had applied for housing. And she thought, wow, that's a, that's a bizarre but fascinating experiment. That's this, so this actually works. Money can actually empower um, people who had been living on the street for 40 years. And what then happened is that she said, you know what, I'm going to quit my job. She had some job at a, at a high up at the corporate ladder. I think she was an organization consultant or something like that. She quit that job and started an NGO. And when I met her in Vancouver uh, about a year ago, she had just received half a million in government funding to start the first long-term study of giving cash to the homeless, you know, a very rigorous scientific experiment, a randomized control trial. I, I, I love that story so much because in the first place, it shows you the power of ideas. I mean, I hear about this experiment that happened in London. I write a book about it, a woman in Holland actually, uh, read that book, gave it to her son, who gave it to, you know, who read it during a long plane flight from Amsterdam to Vancouver, who gave it to a friend, who gave it to another friend, and that was that woman who started, quit her job and started that NGO. And there we have the experiment. So it's contagious, right? These ideas are spreading in this way around the globe. I think that's, that's hugely um, inspirational. And it also shows you that often real change, as I said before, doesn't start in the center, but it starts on the fringes. Um, how, is this, uh, how is this an investment? Well, I, I, I uh, already talked about that. It could actually be an investment that pays for itself. If you just look at some very simple numbers, we know from a recent study that for a rich country like the US, the cost of child poverty is pretty big like in terms of higher healthcare costs, higher crime rates, you know, kids doing less well in school. It's estimated at $500 billion. Well, how much would it cost to eradicate poverty? Much less. 175 billion. So this is what I always say to people who are on the right side of politics. Um, it's not a coincidence that someone like Milton Friedman, the great neoliberal, or Friedrich von Hayek were also in favor of basic income. I mean, to put it bluntly, if you don't have a heart, at least you have a wallet, right? So it makes financial sense. That is one of the most exciting things about basic income. It moves beyond these traditional old-fashioned distinction between the political left and the political right. Okay, so my time is almost up, and therefore I wanted to, to close with this, uh, this lovely line that always comes up in the basic income debate. It's from Victor Hugo. Now, I should, I should mention to you that in the 60s, almost everyone believed that some form of basic income was going to be a reality in Canada and the US. It almost happened. Richard Nixon got his proposal through Congress twice, uh, or, to, or through the House of Representatives, sorry, I should say. But in the Senate, it was killed twice as well. By who? Well, by the Democrats. Not because they didn't like the idea, but because they wanted a higher basic income. And they said, well, this idea is so popular, it will be reality anyway in the future. So we'll vote against it for now and then in the future. Well, it didn't work out that way. One other terrible irony was in 1978 that uh, there was a big experiment in Seattle, and again, researchers noted a lot of great improvement, but there was one finding that was very problematic. They discovered that the divorce rate of, of, of you know, marriage breaking up had gone up by 50%. Now, I think that's great news, it's much safer. Uh, but, you know, 50%, all the conservatives at that point said, we don't want basic in income anymore, it's, it's, it's a terrible idea. It was only 10 years later that they found out that a statistical mistake had been made. So that just shows you that history in the end is not governed by you know, abstract laws or nothing is inevitable. There are so many bizarre contingencies. Um, so why I'm closing off with this quote, all this time, all the, the economists like John Kenneth Galbraith or Milton Friedman were quoting Victor Hugo all the time. Stronger than a thousand armies is an idea whose time has come. 
Well, it didn't come in the 60s or the beginning of the 70s. But nowadays, we know that we are rich enough, we are wealthy enough, we've got the evidence, we've got the means, we should do it right now. Thank you very much. All right. Questions are flying in, flying in. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start with one of my questions, actually. It's a, uh -huh. it's a clarification more than a question. Sure. What's the difference between um, universal basic income and we welfare? That's a great question. Uh, the, the, the most obvious difference is that a, a basic income is absolutely unconditional. Okay. So in the current system, you have to prove over and over again that you're sick enough, that you're depressed enough, and you have right. to fill in lots of forms and go to lots of interviews with government officials, and then at the end of the day, you get a bit of support. So the UBI is no strings attached. Exactly. Whatsoever. Exactly. Here you go. A and is there a number on this? You know, how much one gives? It's enough to pay the basics, right? It, dep it differs, obviously, from country to country, but okay. uh, it would be enough to, you know, get you just above the poverty line. Are there any countries, this is a question from Pablo, are there any countries mm -hmm. that are better candidates for UBI than others? Well, that's a really hard question, actually. Um, for example, you would say that richer countries are maybe the best candidates to start experimenting <laughs> with it. And it's true. I mean, Finland is, is doing this trial. Canada is doing an even bigger and more exciting experiment. But actually, there are, there are lots of policymakers in India right now who are interested in basic income as well, because it's the most efficient and most transparent way to get money to the people who really need it. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they've got hundreds of anti-poverty programs in India, and not much of the support or the money that people actually need ends up in their pockets. You know, there's a lot of corruption over there. So I find it hard to really answer that question. I think there's, there's something in it for, for every country, but for different reasons. You mentioned Finland. The question came up here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's up there. Why do you think Finland did not succeed in their trial for well, basic income? Well, I think there was a huge amount of bullshit <laughs> about the Finnish experiment in, uh, in the press. So what happened is that they started an experiment and from the start, everyone knew that it was going to last for two years. And then at some point, like a few couple of months ago, they asked, can we do it for a longer time, like for four years? And the government said no. And then the international press reported this as basic income has failed and the Finnish stopped this or whatever. What we do know, what is like really going on, is that at the end of 2019, the results from the Finnish trial will come in. But it's just one of the many. And as I said, actually, Canada is doing a, a trial that is more than three times as big as the Finnish one, which I think is much more exciting. And, well, we've got a huge amount of evidence from the past, you know, experiments mm. from the US and Canada in the 70s. Um, so we already know quite a lot about it. Okay, but let me challenge you there, because you said this thing about if you don't have a heart, at least you have a wallet, mm -hmm. right? The, the maths, the numbers speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. what, what is it, then, that... Where, where's the resistance coming from? What, well, why don't we just do it? I believe that the real obstacle towards a basic income is not about technology or about economics. It's about ideology. So we've got this old-fashioned Calvinist mm. <laughs> uh, ideology uh, about you have to work for your money. We've got very outdated definitions of what work is what real jobs are like, yeah, but et we, we teach our so kids, we teach our kids, you have to work, you have to do, nothing comes for free, you've got to put in effort. This kind of goes against it, doesn't it? You know, I, I'm going to mm -hmm. push you on this. Yeah, yeah, all what right, all right, all right. Well, I guess this all goes back to, because that's the most fundamental disagreement uh, that people have about basic income. What is your image of human nature? What do you think people are really like? Do we need to be forced into jobs? Mm -hmm. Do we need to be forced by the government or by poverty or by hunger or whatever? Or is there something called intrinsic motivation? Are we meaning-seeking creatures, storytelling creatures? You know, mm -hmm. Do we want to contribute anyway? Is that what the majority of humanity is like? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the latter is true. And I also think there's a huge amount of evidence from psychology, from economics, from history, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. that that is actually true. And if we assume that in other people, if we say, I think you've got great ideas, I've got think you've got great ambitions, uh, then that is what you elicit out of them, right? So these can become self-fulfilling prophecies. So um, you basically get what you wish for, that type of thing, yeah? I mean, if you think mm -hmm. worst of people, you'll get the worst back, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, I mean, many people probably have this experience as, a, as an employer, you know? If you, if you treat your, your employees in a way, and, and you know, in a very distrusting way, 
mm -hmm. then often you create the kind of people that you, that you were afraid of in the first place. And it's the same with governments. So if you think that people are, are corrupt and are trying to you know, commit fraud all the time, yeah, you're going to create that kind of society. Okay, so when you give people this basic uh, uh, income, what do they use that money for? Mm -hmm. Let, let's give you a really extreme example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay? sure. Um, been unemployed a long time, never really had a proper job, uh, take a few too many drugs in my spare time, mm -hmm. not really contributing to society. Is this a candidate for UBI as well? I mean, sure. Yeah? Everyone gets it. It's a human Everyone right. gets it. Yeah. It's for the human being there. Yeah. Yeah. The belief that they're underneath. Now, obviously, don't get me wrong, if it would be true that most people would waste it on drugs or alcohol or would sit on the couch and watch Netflix all day, I would be against basic income. Okay. Obviously, I would be against it. It's just there's not a single piece of evidence, not a single experiment around the globe that ever showed that that is true. It's all in our ima imagination. So you're you know? saying they don't spend well, it on more drugs? Yeah, well, what my experience is, when I ask audiences, what would you do with a basic income? You. Like 99% of, of all people say, you know, I've got great ideas, ambitions, don't worry about me. It's the other people you should be worrying about, mm. right? Well, yeah, right? They'll waste it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, we can have this discussion for a very long time, but I think it's just important to look at the evidence. There's been a huge World Bank study, for example, yeah. uh, into cash transfers, unconditional cash, cash transfers, where they give big amounts of money to very poor people. Alcohol consumption actually goes down. Tobacco consumption actually goes okay. down. Fascinating. We've got another question here I'd like to put from Mia. Uh, says, uh, let's say UBI gets uh, applied on a global scale. Wouldn't inflation just go <laughs> and basically all zero again? On a global scale? Well, these are much more utopian thinkers than I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is funnily one of the questions I get the most. If we would finance the basic income by just printing out money, uh, then obviously the money supply will increase. The amount of goods and services that we produce will not increase by that much and we'll have massive inflation. Just look at Weimar Germany, right? We've seen that before. That's not what I'm arguing for. I'm saying that we should finance the basic income just in the way that we finance the welfare state right now, with taxes. Now, in the long run, I believe this will also actually help us to reduce a lot of government spending in other levels, you know, in other respects, you know, less spending on healthcare, crime, police, etc. This is what we find in those experiments. Mm. Uh, so in that scenario, inflation is not the issue. It's not the issue. No, because you don't increase the total money supply, right? Mm. So maybe Bill Gates gets 10 basic incomes or 100, but he'll pay for 500, right? Mm. So the real question is, it, it becomes a bit technical maybe, but the real question is, is, what is the net redistribution that's going on if you finance a basic income? To be honest, for many people in this audience, there won't change much. You'll get a basic income, You'll pay a bit more in taxes to finance the basic income. Zero change. But for other people who want to make different choices in their lives, they suddenly have this platform that they can yeah, always yeah. stand on. It's venture capital, you know, the ability to take risks. Plus, we are facing a future where basically there just won't be enough jobs for the people populating mm -hmm. the planet, right? Isn't that another mm -hmm. basic argument that you know, you're going to be sitting around basically? Mm -hmm. what are you you don't have income. Well, here's maybe the, the most important takeaway of, of what I'm trying to say today, is let's never underestimate capitalism's extraordinary ability to come up with new bullshit jobs. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so nowadays it's about 30%, maybe 40% mm -hmm. already in Norway. It could be 60% yeah. in the future, it could be 100%. If we don't get rid of this ideology, if we don't get rid of these outdated definitions of work, mm -hmm. we could be living in some future society where there's some kind of massive secret that we're all sitting in an office and no one's talking about that we're not really doing anything. I'm just thinking whether I have a bullshit job. That's what I mean. <laughs> well, it's for you to decide. No, I don't have a bullshit job. I know I don't have a bullshit job. Okay, should we, should we have a little, should we put uh, the audience here? Uh, people in favor of UBI based on this great presentation. Hands up if you, if you see a future for this. Uh, and those who are either skeptical or no, I don't think this is g really going to work. A few, uh, seems like your talk did the, did the job here. Thank you great. so much, Rick. It was great, yeah? Thanks. Great. Well done. <laughs>